Hello and welcome to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues, all from a Catholic perspective. I am your host, Catherine Hadro, in our Washington, D.C. studio. Thank you for joining us. In this week's show, two-year-old Ellie, born at 21 weeks and six days, was one of President Trump's special guests at the State of the Union. Ellie and her mother, Robin, join us here. Democratic presidential candidates share their extreme abortion views at an abortion advocacy event this past weekend. We speak out. And this. He's an award-winning Christian music artist. We hear how Matt Hammett put his faith in action when he defied doctor's advice and did not abort his son. But first, our top story, the Senate Judiciary Committee held a hearing this week on the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act. This hearing is about babies that are born alive, surviving a botched abortion attempt, and whether or not they should be provided the same level of medical care that would be provided to any other baby at the same gestational stage. That's Nebraska Senator Ben Sass, who chaired the hearing and sponsored the Born Alive bill in the Senate. The bill would require newborns who survive botched abortions receive the appropriate medical care for their gestational age. This week's hearing comes after the bill was stopped by a filibuster in the Senate last year, despite receiving bipartisan majority support. Senators used the Born Alive hearing as a chance to voice their support or opposition to the bill. I believe very strongly that we should control our own bodies in connection with our faith and um, medical ethics. We should be able to unite around the premise that every baby born alive should be provided with the same standard of care without regard to whether her parents wanted her. That was Republican Senator Mike Lee of Utah who sits on the Senate Judiciary Committee and now he joins us from Capitol Hill. Senator, thank you for being here. Thank you. First off, why did the Senate Judiciary Committee hold a hearing on the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act this week? We held this hearing because we find that in some circumstances, children are born in a failed abortion attempt. And after the uh, doctor has failed to terminate the baby's life, uh, we need protections in place to make sure that that person is treated as a person and would receive the same life sustaining assistance, medically and otherwise, that the child would receive if the child's parents and the mother's doctor hadn't made the decision to abort the child. Uh, what we found is that there are many documented circumstances in which babies have survived an abortion and thereafter been placed in a utility room or left on a table someplace to die and to suffer. That's not right and it's not humane and we shouldn't be doing it. During the hearing, it seemed as if the senators and witnesses who opposed this bill were more interested in discussing the legality of abortion than discussing the actual abortion attempt survivors. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I found that interesting that some of my colleagues, uh, particularly on the Democratic side of the aisle, repeatedly wanted to make the hearing about something uh, else, something other than it was actually focused on. Uh, many of them kept bringing up abortion and claiming that this was about Roe versus Wade itself or that it was about abortion. This hearing today was not about abortion. It was about what happens when a baby survives an abortion. Uh, that is legally different uh, than what they're describing. According to their own terms, their own defense of an abortion is that it's somehow different that the baby hasn't yet been born. So under their own standards, they ought to be concerned as they are not concerned when the baby's life is taken in utero. And they certainly ought to be concerned when that baby has been born and takes its first breath and can cry and still has a, a, a noticeable heartbeat surviving outside the womb. Uh, we ought to be concerned about that and we ought to prohibit the medical neglect of an infant born alive following a botched abortion. Opponents of this Born Alive legislation often argue infanticide is already illegal. But, Senator, can you explain how infants who survive abortion attempts are not protected under existing law? Well, first of all, if infanticide is already illegal, then they shouldn't be worried about this. It begs the question, what are they so concerned about? Are they really trying to defend the practice of abandoning a recently born baby uh, uh, simply because that baby was supposed to be killed through an abortion. 
and allowing that baby to suffer? I, I, I think not. I can't imagine that it would be. Now, it is true that a number of years ago, Congress passed another piece of legislation uh, declaring that a child born after a failed abortion is, in fact, human and is, in fact, alive. But it didn't contain any penalties for health care providers that facilitated the abortion and then neglected the baby thereafter. That's what this bill is designed to cover. One of your fellow senators on the Senate Judiciary Committee is Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar. She's currently running to be the Democratic nominee for president and was not at this week's Born Alive hearing. But in an interview with The View this week, Senator Klobuchar said, quote, there are pro-life Democrats and they are part of our party and I think we need to build a big tent. In light of these comments, what would you want to emphasize to Senator Klobuchar about the Born Alive bill, considering she voted against it last year? Yeah, so I'd say to Senator Klobuchar, I'd say to all of my colleagues, um, if, if you want to build a big tent, that's great. And that tent doesn't even have to extend into what they seem to regard as a, uh, the, the zone of protection around abortion, because this bill doesn't even deal with abortion. It doesn't restrict the performance of an abortion. It simply says that when you try to kill a baby through an abortion, and that baby is born alive, you shouldn't pretend as if it's not human. You shouldn't dispose of it as if it were medical waste. You shouldn't take that baby and hide it in a utility room waiting for it to die a slow, painful, suffering death. I don't think that's either Republican or Democratic. I don't think that's either liberal or conservative. That's simply a human instinct. And any society that's not willing to recognize that has got a huge set of problems to deal with. Senator Mike Lee of Utah, thank you for your time. Thank you. For continued pro-life analysis, we're joined now by Marilyn Musgrave, a former U.S. representative for the state of Colorado and now the vice president of government affairs for the Susan B. Anthony List. Thank you for being here. It's great to be here. Thank you. Congresswoman, first off, can you speak to Senator Lee's pro-life leadership? What a hero. I mean, mm. you think about what he's done this week. Uh, I think about a statement he made in that hearing. Uh, mm. Wantedness does not determine humanness. We're so grateful he's on the Judiciary Committee. When you think of this most pro-life president ever nominating uh, these judges and the confirmation process in the United States Senate, it is wonderful to have Senator Lee there. We can always count on him. And speaking of this week's hearing on the Born Alive bill, last year the Born Alive bill was blocked in the Senate, but does it have a better chance of passing now, this year? Well, first of all, I'd just like to say probably doesn't, mm -hmm. okay? Same people. Mm -hmm. uh, the Pelosi House, of course, has resisted it. Um, we've had Republicans in the House, 80 Republicans asked for unanimous consent for the bill to be brought up for a vote. We've had Whip's lease work very hard on a discharge petition. I think now he has 206 signatures. And I think it's important to clarify because pro-lifers have majority in the Senate, but would it still be unlikely to pass in the Senate as well? Well, what they can't do is, as they have a vote on whether or not to bring the bill up, they can't get the 60 required votes, because we don't have 60. We have great leadership in the United States Senate, and they're doing everything they can over there, and Mike Lee is definitely a leader in that. The Born Alive bill, as its name suggests, concerns babies who survive abortion attempts and have already been born. Just last week on The View, Democratic presidential candidate Pete Buttigieg denied that abortion survivors are ever refused medical care. Can you speak, though, to the reality of why this bill is necessary? Well, of course it's necessary. Uh, in committee this week, we had Petrina Mosley mm. from the Family Research Council citing from CDC, Center for Disease mm -hmm. Control and Prevention, about how in the last few years at least 143 babies have survived failed abortions. They died. Mm -hmm. We don't know if they got any medical care or not. And the mm -hmm. CDC says openly that those are low numbers. We know there were more. It's just because of the lack of good reporting that we don't have better numbers. We've had Melissa Oden here. You've had her on your show, mm -hmm. Catherine. Her mother had a saline abortion. She had the saline in her body for five days, yet Melissa was born alive. And two nurses saved her life, and here she is today, 
a pro-life leader mm -hmm. in our country. Thank you, as always, for your insight. Congresswoman Marilyn Musgrave of the Susan B. Anthony List, thank you. It's great to be with you, Catherine. The pain-capable Unborn Child Protection Act would ban abortion after five months of pregnancy, the point at which science suggests an unborn child can feel pain. This is common sense legislation that would protect the most vulnerable among us. Unfortunately, it has stalled in the Congress. Despite receiving the support of a bipartisan majority of U.S. Senators in 2019, this bill was blocked from further consideration. It is vital that this pro-life legislation is once again brought up for a vote and that brings us to this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com to tell your senator to urge a vote on the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act and to vote yes. Once you get to ProLifeWeekly.com, all you will do is type in some basic information so we can connect you with your senator and you can send your pro-life message straight to them. Again, the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act would ban elective abortions after five months of pregnancy the point at which science suggests unborn children can feel pain. Make sure to tell your senator to urge a vote on the pain-capable bill and to vote yes by going to ProLifeWeekly.com. Turning now to our next segment, President Trump invited these two to be his special guests at the State of the Union last week, and we invited them to be special guests of ours this week. Through the skill of her doctors and the prayers of her parents, Little Ellie kept on winning the battle of life. Today, Ellie is a strong, healthy two-year-old girl sitting with her amazing mother, Robin. In the gallery, Ellie and Robin, we are glad to have you with us tonight. That's Ellie and Robin Schneider at last week's 2020 State of the Union Address. Ellie is one of the earliest premature babies ever to survive. During the State of the Union, President Donald Trump pointed to the family's incredible witness of survival and said Ellie's witness is why he is asking Congress to provide an additional $50 million to fund neonatal research and to pass legislation banning late-term abortion. Now joining us from Kansas City, Kansas is Robin and little Ellie Schneider. Welcome both of you to the show. First off, it's been one week since you were at the State of the Union. Tell us, what was it like to be guests of the President of the United States and forever a part of history? It's very remarkable, especially for someone like me who loves history and um, now I get to be part of history that was made this year. Um, it just blows my mind to think that someday someone will read President Trump's speech and my daughter will be mentioned. Robin, when did you receive an invitation? What details can you share with us? Um, well, I first heard from the White House they had considered bringing us out for the March for Life um, event this year. Um, and then I, I hadn't heard anything from them. That was about the beginning of January. Um, so I, I thought that that chapter was over. But on the 25th, which is the day after the march, they called me and asked if we would like to come to the State of the Union as President Trump's guest. And um, I was just blown away. I started crying and laughing. It was, it was quite the scene. <laughs> but we were very excited. And of course, we said yes right away. And during that State of the Union address, the president pointed to Ellie's witness to make a major announcement. Let's take a listen. I am asking Congress to provide an additional $50 million to fund neonatal research for America's youngest patients. Robin, what went through your mind in that moment? I'm so excited because prematurity, I feel like, is not a forefront issue. People don't know that much about prematurity. They don't know about these babies that are born um, before they're supposed to be. Um, and when he, all of a sudden, in front of the nations, in front of all of these people, talked about these um, preemie babies who have no witness and talked about funding more research, which is what saved my daughter's life. I was just, I was in tears. It, it was so much for me. I love Ellie's singing voice. 
And Robin, last week you spoke with my colleague Tracy Sable on EW Chan News Nightly and said Ellie's medical care totaled up to about $10 million. It is so difficult to wrap my head around that number, but Robin, can you speak to the reality of high medical costs facing families of premature babies? Yeah, um, when I, thankfully, um, we were able to get assistance to pay for that. But when I first saw that bill, um, I just, I think I went into shock. I just started laughing because who can pay that? Who can afford to pay $10 million? And that was only for her NICU stay. That wasn't for any of the care afterwards, which she has um, two therapists and she was going to a follow-up clinic and a radi regular pediatrician. And um, she has two medicines that she has to take daily. Mm. And one of those medications is $30,000 a month. So preemies are extremely expensive and mm -hmm. under a lot of insurance, proposed insurance laws, they would be deemed as pre-existing conditions, which would mean parents would be paying for that out of pocket. And Ellie is one of the youngest premature babies ever to survive. Can you describe the condition of her health when she was born? Um, she was not supposed to survive. She was only 13 ounces. She had no body fat. Um, her skin was translucent and broke apart when it was touched. Mm -hmm. um, you could see her organs through her skin because she was so tiny. And look at her today. I mean, um, she's so alive. She's moving and so alive today. I know. Yes. And finally, Robin, I read that you consider Ellie's survival a miracle. Can you tell us more about why? When you, when you go to a doctor and they tell you that your baby is going to die, there is nothing like the gut punch that comes from that. And when you go to five doctors and they all say the exact same thing, you begin to actually believe it. Um, and, you know, she would have died if God hadn't sent us to the ultrasound tech when we did, if they hadn't caught the problem when they did, if we hadn't had the doctors and staff that we had, if the exact doctor at St. Luke's um, of neonatology hadn't been on call that night, she would not have made it. Um, she should not have made it. All of the odds were stacked against her. If you try to use prematurity data on her, it doesn't work. The statistics fail. There are none. Her chance of survival was less than zero. And her chance of survival without major complications was even less than that. So the fact that she survived Ow. and did has done so well um, it's not comprehensible by a uh, human. <laughs> the only way you can explain it is by the hand of God. And not only has she survived, she's in the nation's spotlight. It's really an incredible story and witness. Robin and Ellie Schneider, thank you for sharing your family's witness with us. Thank you for having us today. When we come back. So we really had several months where we had to really wait and pray and trust Award-winning Christian music artist Matt Hammett shares how his family put their faith in action when they defied doctor's advice and chose life for their son. Stay tuned as EWTM Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. Welcome back to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. I'm your host, Katherine Hadro. Eight Democratic presidential candidates participated in a pro-abortion forum in New Hampshire last weekend. That is this week's Speak Out segment. The Our Rights, Our Courts Forum, co-sponsored by pro-abortion groups, including the Demand Justice Initiative, the Center for Reproductive Rights, and NARAL, Pro-Choice America, focused on using the federal judiciary to protect abortion. The time has come to trust women to make decisions for themselves. 
I will never nominate anybody for the Supreme Court or any federal court who is not 100% pro Roe v. Wade. These Democratic presidential candidates dedicated the final Saturday before New Hampshire's high stakes first in the nation presidential primary to emphasizing their commitment to abortion and Roe v. Wade. This is time that could have been dedicated to knocking on a few more doors or holding a few more town halls with voters, but they chose to spend it with NARAL instead. This shouldn't come as a surprise. We have spent months reporting on these candidates and their willingness to defend abortion at any cost. But the primary season will soon be over, and the Democratic nominee will have to answer for this position to voters in November. And I don't think voters will like it. Remember, there is something you can do to counter today's culture of death. Follow this week's Call to Action. Go to ProLegWeekly.com to tell your senator to urge a vote on the pain-capable Unborn Child Protection Act and to vote yes. For 20 years, Matt Hammett was lead singer of an award-winning Christian band. He's still singing today, but his latest musical partner is a lot younger and a lot closer to home. That is Matt Hammett and his nine-year-old son, Bowen, singing their original song, Whole Heart. Hammett, formerly of the Christian band Sanctus Real, was at the height of his career when he and his wife learned that Bowen, who was not yet born, had a life-threatening heart disease. Doctors pressured the Hammetts to abort, but as you can see, they defy doctors' advice and their brave son is thriving today after undergoing three major open-heart surgeries. The father-son duo recently sat down with me to share their family's journey for this week's Pro-Life Focus. Matt and Bowen, it is so good to meet you. That's great, great to be you here. Too. Thanks for being <laughs> here. And Bowen, you look so healthy and handsome to me, but I know that you've had your share of some medical challenges. Can you share some of that with our viewers? Uh, well, I have a half a heart and robustic left heart syndrome, and I just had a surgery uh, about like six months ago, and it was my third open heart surgery. So. I think it will be the last one. Wow, you are so brave. You're so brave. Matt, I can only imagine what it's like then to have to watch your little one, yeah. have to suffer, go through hard things. As a father, can you take us back to when Bowen was born? Yeah, you know, we found out that Bowen's heart uh, was, you know, well, he only had half of a heart uh, when he was in utero still. So it was in April of 2010 and he was due in September. So we really had several months where we had to really wait and pray and trust and um, just you know prepare for when he was born knowing that it was gonna be a hard road. And I understand during the pregnancy, doctors were not optimistic. Yeah, that's an understatement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we were told that he would be missing fingers and toes and have all kinds of different syndromes. And we had so many diagnoses that were um, given to us. They told us that, uh, you know, his life would be in the hospital. There were, the list goes on. Mm -hmm. And so multiple times from more than one doctor, we were told that it wouldn't, you know, we should just terminate our pregnancy. And through that pressure, you obviously didn't listen to what the doctors were yeah, saying no. because here is Bowen. And just to hear what the doctors were saying, but to see Bowen in front of my eyes, I mean, Bowen, what do you want our viewers to know about your life and your well-being? Uh, that I'm healthy and I'm, uh, that I'm, I'm glad that I'm out of the hospital. And uh, I love it when he says I'm healthy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like that's his, that's his outlook. And you know? that I'm living and, yeah. yeah. You're third grade, you yeah. have three siblings. <laughs> you have a full life. Yeah. It's so beautiful to see. The question that just came to mind is the fact yeah. that God did want that win here. He yeah, is that's right. here. That's right. What do you think that purpose is? Well, it's pretty wild to watch his creative uh his creative energy <laughs> and just the way that he lives his life. I didn't start writing songs till I was 15 years old. 
and Bowen, you know, is like writing songs all the time. And we even recorded a CD for him of songs that he wrote before his last open heart surgery. I'm just so proud of him because he loves to use his voice to share the story God's given him. What an impressive nine-year-old, wow. And what is your main message you wanted people to know uh, with that CD? Um, that the, it's like they're gonna be okay because I faced it. And people that have the same thing as me or anything they're going through, they're gonna be okay. And I understand you two are going to perform together at the pro-life group Save the Storks Ball. Yeah. Why did you decide to get involved with Save the Storks and in the pro-life movement? Yeah, so I met a guy named Joe Baker a few years back, and uh, he just had this crazy vision, you know, about this mobile ultrasound ministry, and it was wild to watch the impact it was having on people four out of five women who are stepping into these buses and choosing life. Speaking of you performing and sharing life-affirming messages yeah. through song, if you both would feel comfortable, could you share your gift of song with us and our viewers? You wanna sing the first verse? Yeah. I wish I had my guitar here, I'd back <laughs> you up. Dude, you ready? Go for it. You're so close to my heart, I can feel it. I hear your wind moving in my spirit. Whispering, come and find your healing. When I'm scared, I just keep on breathing. I know that I have a rhyme and a reason. I have the faith that it takes to keep believing. <laughs> Good job, buddy. I think we have a future <laughs> award-winning Christian artist hey, right here. I don't doubt it at all. <laughs> Matt and Bowen, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Yeah, hey, you're very welcome. Thanks for having us. What a beautiful example of fatherly protection for his child's life. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's show. Before we let you go, I have some exciting EWTM Pro Life Weekly news to share. When you tune in to the broadcast next week, you'll notice our show will look different. We are updating our studio and our graphics and giving EWTM Pro Life Weekly an updated, fresh, bright, bold new look. I cannot wait to share it with you all. But until that special show next week, be sure to reach us at prolifeweekly at EWTN.com or connect with us on social media. Just search for EWTM Pro Life on all the major platforms. And remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.